Hello friends, welcome back. This video is about anti-androgens and this is the group of uh, drug that is that's usually seen under the reproductive pharmacology and um, I will talk about the different clinical scenarios that you can use this drug um, but let's start with the mechanism of action. Okay, so let's talk about the mechanism of action for each one of them. So first we have flutamide. So the mechanism of action of flutamide is that it inhibits 5-alpha reductase, 5-alpha reductase. And what does this 5-alpha reductase do? They convert, they convert testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. They convert testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. Now, dihydrotestosterone is the more uh, potent of the two. So, testosterone is potent, but dihydrotestosterone is more potent than testosterone. Okay? So, that is the mechanism of action of flutamide. It inhibits 5-alpha reductase. Okay, it's a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. All right, let's continue. The next one is finasteride. Okay? What does finasteride do? So what I'm talking about, I'm going to be talking about the mechanism of action of each one of them and then I will talk about the clinical uh, clinical use of each of these drugs. So finasteride, this one inhibits testosterone receptors. Okay? Uh, test. Okay, this one inhibits uh, testosterone receptors. Now, the interesting thing is that you know how you can you can say how does it inhibit testosterone receptors? It does it competitively. Okay. Okay, so it does it competitively. So think of um, this is where you should be thinking of those grafts um, where they have the KM and the Vmax and how competitive is going to look versus um, non-competitive. So let me quickly pull that up. Okay, so this is a great diagram for learning competitive and non-competitive. So you can see that um, the normal one, no inhibitor is the red one. Okay, so that's a normal one. So when we have competitive inhibition, which is the green one right here, when we have competitive inhibition, our KM increases. Okay, so you have to rem remember that KM approaches zero. That's competitive inhibition. But when we're talking about uh, non-competitive inhibitor, our Vmax increases. Okay, Vmax is going up. So you can also think about it in, in a, another way. You can remember is that the competitive one moves on the x-axis, and the non-competitive one moves on the y-axis. And competitive one deals with KM, non-competitive one deals with Vmax. So since we're talking about competitive and non-competitive, um, let me quickly also talk about how exactly they work. So when we're talking about competitive uh, receptor or competitive inhibition, both the substrate and the competition is, fine, is, is uh, competing for the same binding site. So the, there is one chair and both my drug and my um, substrate wants to sit in that chair, okay, which will control the whole protein. Now think about non-competitive inhibitor. They're not fighting for the same chair. They have two different chairs, but once someone sits on that chair, it changes the shape of the protein, okay? So that's non-competitive. So even though you're sitting on a different binding site, it's changing the protein and the substrate cannot bind to it anymore because of that change. All right, so that was a quick review of competitive versus non-competitive. Okay, moving on. Okay, so finasteride, we talked about it inhibits testosterone receptors competitively. Also, one more thing is that finasteride is, it's non-steroidal. This drug is non-steroid. So you might think that this is binding to a steroid it must be a steroid itself no but this drug is a non-steroid all right moving on to the next one and the next one is ketoconazole now ketoconazole and spironolactone or spironolactone however you say it 
they both inhibit uh, steroids. One inhibits by binding, inhibits binding of steroid, the other inhibits synthesis of steroid. So which one is which? Can you think of which one inhibits binding and which one inhibits uh, uh, synthesis? Okay, so this is how I remember it. S for, synth you know, spironolactone, but this S1 is not going to be synthesis. The synthesis is going to be here. So this one is going to inhibit synthesis of steroid. So it's the opposite. This one is going to be inhibit binding of steroid. Okay? Inhibits binding of steroid. So that's that's the mechanism of action of antiandrogens. Now let's talk about um, some of the clinical use of these drugs. Okay, so clinical use for flutamide. Uh, flutamide, you know, we are decreasing the level of uh, t uh, dihydrotestosterone, which is a more potent form of testosterone, and the clinical use is BPH benign prostatic hyperplasia. We don't want more testosterone, more to put in testosterone to cause an increase in that BPH. And in terms of finasteride, clinical use of finasteride, this one is going to inhibit prostate cancer. Okay, this one is going to inhibit prostate cancer. Okay, so that's the use of uh, finasteride. And the latter two drugs, ketoconazole and spironolactone, here the clinical use, use is same for both. Okay, so the clinical use is it's used in hirsutism in PCOS patient. What is hirsutism? Uh, excuse me, hirsutism is the um, is the excessive hair growth in females, okay? It's used in hirsutism in PCOS patient. What's PCOS? PCOS is a polycystic ovarian, um, polycystic ovarian syndrome. Okay, it's used in PCOS. So it's used only for hirsutism in PCOS. That's the clinical use for both. Um, now, what about some of the toxicities of ketoconazole and spironolactone? Okay. Toxicity is going to be um, okay, so toxicity is uh, gynecomastia um, and the toxicity is the same for both of them, spironolactone and ketoconazole. Okay, so, well, gynecomastia for male, and also they're going to have um, amenorrhea in females, okay? So, um, those are the, uh, those are the clinical, use, uh, clinic use and, clinical use and toxicity of ketoconazole and spironolactone. Another clinical use for flutamide is um, male pattern baldness, okay? So when there is a baldness in males, you can use this drug to promote some hair, okay? So this promotes hair growth. And... Um, this will also cause some gynecomastia in, in males um, when we use uh, flutamide, okay? So you can say that toxicity could be gynecomastia. Is there anything else I'm missing out? Yes, one more thing, and that is uh, when we talk about uh, ketoconazole, uh, we said that it inhibits steroid synthesis. And there is sometimes, uh, I remember, you know, seeing it in a question that it also inhibits a desmolase. Okay, so I'm just going to add here that it also inhibits desmolase. Uh, it's just a little bit 
a little bit more specific. Can you think of where you see desmolase uh, in, 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 in medicine? Uh, desmolase is usually seen in, um, in the adrenal glands when cholesterol is being broken down to pregnenolone. Okay? So I can add it here. So cholesterol to pregnenolone uses desmolase. Okay, that's it. Uh, these drugs are not that difficult. It's quite simple. Um, hopefully this was helpful to you. Um, okay, so I'll see you guys in my next video and I'll post these notes on my blog. Bye for now.